Okay, um, I, I just uh, really delighted to introduce Mark Hannell from Figshare. Um, here at the University Data Library, we've set up an institutional data repository in DSpace called Edinburgh Data Share, and we're always trying to figure out how to make it more appealing for the researchers to deposit their data. So um, we've been talking about collaborating, and we certainly have a lot to learn from Mark Hannell, who's um, come up with a, a, a Web2 kind of... Uh, application for depositing data called Figshare. And um, the idea behind it uh, is um, publish all of your data, including the results that aren't necessarily publishable in journals. And um, uh, yeah, so, um, oh yeah, I was going to say uh, all the work that we're doing in the uh, research data management program is we really think of it as long-term culture change, you know, uh, developing this culture of sharing. And uh, so I was really pleased to find out about Mark's work and that he really represents a new generation of scientists. Um, and he just came up with this idea based on his own experience working on his PhD at Imperial College London. So um, I hope you all will be inspired as I have been. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Robin. Um, I just hope that everyone's not mad at me that I don't have a guitar and it's not going to be as fun, but, you know. So, um, <laughs> I've got that song in my head now, all I can think of. But, um, so, basically, it's a bit of a different to the other repositories in what it does, but um, what I'm thinking is that one of the big problems that everyone seems to be having is incentivizing people to upload their data. and. Uh, this is mainly going to be focusing on what would incentivize myself as a scientist to upload my research data to repositories like this. And unfortunately, there might not be too many parallels with the arts world, but hopefully the, the scientists among us will get something out of it. So uh, this is where it all started. So as, as Robin said, I was doing a PhD, just finishing off now, and um, started off really great, started generating data, and I thought this is fantastic. And so I generated figures like this, and went from there, and then after a few months, I realized that my, my data started to look like this. Uh, after, in, you know, each day you do a new experiment, you generate more figures. The next day, the next month, it looks like this, and so on and so forth. And so I generated this massive, massive amount of data uh, during my PhD. And I swear to you, this is a fraction of the graphs and representations that I have from my PhD. And what I then realized was... I've got that subset in the pink circle over there. And that's the amount of data that I'm looking to publish from my PhD. It's probably about 30 figures. And uh, the rest of it is stuck in a lab book in Imperial College if anybody wants to go and look it up. But other than that, I was thinking there must be a better way to... In selfishly, I want the work that I've done and my boss has spent a lot of money doing to be out there and for other people to use it because it, it is useful to other people. And so... Looking at this smaller subset, you know, that's all going to be out there and that's fantastic using traditional publication methods. And so I was thinking, what is a way that I can put my research out there so that other people can cite it, other people can use it, or, you know, it's just other people can just reference it and look at it and see if somebody else has done this experiment. And so this was the whole basis behind Figshare, uh, sharing of figures. And so, um, I, as I said, I originally set this up with selfish motive just for myself, and um, it's set up on, it's just hacked together using a MediaWiki base, and um, the good thing about MediaWiki is it's instantly scalable, and so other people talked to me and they said, well, it's useful for yourself, why don't you scale it up so other people can use it, and the idea with wikis is that anybody can edit a wiki. And so, the re you know, why would anybody want to do this? This is getting down to the incentivization of data and why it's useful. And so within that data, I've generated figures that testing what X does to Y, and it'll show no effect. But I know for a fact that a million other people or 20 other labs may have done the same research. And so there's this whole idea of negative data. And it's one of the things that's broken about the publication model as it stands is that 
this, this little caveat here. If you're given a null hypothesis of interest that is true, that um, the association being studied doesn't exist, 5% of studies will show a statistic, statistically significant result. So if you do, if 20 labs around the world are doing the same experiment, one of these labs will get a false positive. So they'll get a difference where there isn't a difference, statistically. And the crazy thing is, I do have sound effects. Oh, okay. So the crazy thing is that um, that one result is the one that will be published and the one that you'll be able to find, uh, the one that you'll be able to find via uh, online searches and what have you. The 19 true results will never be found. They'll be locked away in a lab book somewhere, not even on the internet. And so this is the, the basis of Figshare as it, as it started out as a beta in March. And so you can upload figures, data sets, or media. And the thing about this is, in terms of incentivization, um, it has to be stupidly simple. If you've got a repository and you need to train people to use the repository, as a scientist, I'm never going to do that. If you, if you had to be trained to use Facebook, it wouldn't be successful. And so um, this is just a question of, you get boxes like this. You log in, you enter the title of your figure, your data set, or your media. You push upload. You add a little bit of tagging or whatever really quickly, and immediately you are presented with um, an endpoint. And so the endpoint for a figure looks something like this. And this is just um, another thing about incentivization is that the researchers like to see visualizations of their data as opposed to just hard files. So at the moment, We've categorized it into data sets, media, and figures, but it, it can be any file format. Uh, and what we're working on now is trying to make all of those formats embeddable. So most images will show up, PDFs and things like that will show up, but people make up their own file formats, and so we're trying to embed everything in the page. And if you just have a little bit closer look, what's really good is that this is immediately, um, you can cite this data. So you can do an experiment in a day, and if you look at the top, the page is generated, and it has a persistent identifier. Uh, that's the handle there, where if you click that link, it'll always take you back to that page. So no matter if the website moves or what have you, you know that there's persistence. And if you cite that in a uh, journal, you cite this figure in a journal, you click that link, it'll always bring you to this page. It's got, um, it's got clickable everything. So the tags, you click on the tags, and it'll give you a list of all of the figures that are uploaded with, a similar, with the same tag. And it's got, it's got full text search, so you can just search for anything, and everything with that word in somewhere will come up. And so we also have data sets. Again, incentivizing people. The data sets are embedded, so you can physically look at the data straight away and see if it's what you, something that you were looking for. Um, the author is clickable, so if you Click on the author name, it'll show you everything that's uploaded by this person. So you have a profile page with all of your research objects in one space, which is good, and researchers like to have to show off their work in that respect. Again, as soon as, as, soon as you push upload, fill in the details, submit, you're presented with this page. It's instantly citable. The handle is automatically generated for the page. And then the last thing we were looking at is just Videos. This is another thing against selfish motives. I'm writing up my uh, thesis. I have videos that aren't going to be published, but they show interesting things. And I want to refer to them. So you can just, this is actually um, a video that you, you can link into your thesis. You can reference it. And it's automatically, it's always going to be there. If someone wants to click on the link, they can watch the video that you're referring to without having to publish it formally. And so this is also good. One of the things that I found is if you build a platform for scientists, they use it for completely different things, and they just do their own thing. And so I was thinking that this is really great for dissemination of data. Just by um, making a page for that figure, you have the title of the figure as the title of the page. So it makes it more Googleable. And um, other people came to me and said, you know, but it's great for feedback. So if I put figures that I'm thinking about publishing, but, or it's a work in progress, 
maybe you can, I can upload my figures and ask for feedback from the community and share it through different communities. And so uh, one example of how this started working almost from the get-go is um, people started um, uh, sharing their um, research through different outputs. And so if you, as I said, if you click on an author, you have the profile page and it has all of their, all of their research objects and their data and their media. And it also has an RSS feed. And with this RSS feed, it's just an RSS feed of your research. So you can plug it anywhere. This is friend feed, a friend feed. And this guy plugged in his RSS feed, feed from Figshare to friend feed, uh, disseminating his data to a wider audience. And um, you can see people started to, he left a bit of context about what was, this figure shows. And then you can see here, people started to give him suggestions. You know, they questioned his methodology. They said, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And it's a way of collaborating that people just don't do at the moment other than, and it's automated by just plugging in your RSS feed. You could plug in your RSS feed to a WordPress blog and you automatically have an eLab book. So, as I say, other ideas that people are coming up with. And the, the other thing which is becoming more and more useful is the permanent so storage of something that's always online. For example, this, this presentation is always online, so I can access it from anywhere. If you can access your research from anywhere, um, then you can just, if you're talking about something to someone, you can just log on, show them in, in two seconds. And um, yeah, in terms of permanence, um, this is what I was saying about the citations. So we're working on exporting this to EndNote and what have you, but the main thing for researchers is thinking, if I upload something, is it going to be there in two years? The handles are needed. They're, they're similar to DOIs. Um, everything is listed the, in various ways. You can browse via tags and different ways of searching. And so as I was saying about discoverability, you can, it's full word search and you can browse by anything here. And as I said at the beginning, this was, this was something that I wanted to do for selfish reasons to begin with. And I wanted to make my research more discoverable. It started in March and what, what I was um, really happy to see just in the last week, when I started my PhD, I work in a subject which is mobilization of MSEs, these stem cells. And um, when I started my research, my lab just got some, a big paper out. It was reviewed in Nature. It was the full page three of The Guardian. So big, big news. Um, what I love now is that because of the way data is undiscoverable and figures are trapped inside PDFs and what have you, if I just Google eyes, Google eyes? Talking and writing at the same time. If I just Google mobilization of MSEs, which is what my thesis is on, you'll see that the first results are my figures on Figshare, which are never going to be published because they're interesting and they show stuff, but, you know, that figure's never going to get published. But it might be useful to somebody because it does show real data. And, um, yeah, there's a, there's, you can add links to different uh, things within your thing. So if I just click on the link, this is links to related figures or what have you. And it's, it's an actual, yeah, buggy, <laughs> standard. Um, I might have double clicked. But it's an actual, um, it's the raw data of that figure. And so I was happy to see that it is working in terms of discoverability. And so... Let me just get this going again. And so the thing about this is, I've made my data more discoverable. It's available to everybody, so everybody should be uploading their data. But this is uh, with a budget of zero, and so we're asking all researchers to publish all of their data, which is a controversial subject to begin with. But one of the things that I struggle with about JISC is they, do, they fund these amazing projects, and they're really... Um, they're really useful tools for researchers, and then I never hear about them, and I'm interested in them, and I actively search for them. But because of the, um, uh, the way it's funded, they don't have 
fund 10% of their budget for marketing so researchers actually find out about the tools. I don't know if that's the same for repositories and, and what have you. But what I'd ask you is, is to talk to people about projects like this and simple things like with Figshare, at Figshare on Twitter, when I see a GIST repository update and what have you, and I think that's cool, I don't just think, oh, that's good, that's nice they've done that. I'll retweet it because a retweet is a kind of endorsement of this product and it automatically takes it to a wider audience and it's like they're saying, this is a good thing, go and check it out. Whereas if you just say, oh, yeah, I've seen that, it's not as good. So basically just retweet all of my tweets, thanks. <laughs> we have posters and what have you that you can just, just standard level metrics. And so in the first two months, we had about 150 users and kind of 700 research objects uploaded, which was amazing for me because I was expecting 10. And um, granted, they might be the early adopters. But people said to me, you know, if you're looking... So if I submit a paper and they come back to me and say, have you checked this? And I think, right, I'll Google it. If you want to search a database like this and see, have you checked this? If it's got 700 objects in, the chances are, even if someone's done it, it's not going to be in the database yet. So it was to make the database immediately useful, uh, it was suggested to me to seed the database. And so there's an open access subset of PMC, which is um, 500,000 uh, articles. And again, it's about discoverability. Within those articles, you might find, you might search directly for a figure. You might say, has this been done before? I'll search for it. But because it's embedded in a PDF, you'll never be able to find that figure because it's locked in there somewhere. So this is about cracking open all these PDFs and pulling out every single figure within them, giving their own, their own page, their own citation, so you can cite individually, uh, individual figures you know, to get your exact point across. I'm citing this paper but I'm citing this figure because it shows exactly what I'm saying. And so about a month ago, we started parsing the XML files, which are openly available, pulling out the figures, linking them in the same way that I just showed you with um, each figure is represented as those figures are shown, and um, pulling in about two to 3,000 figures a day, and just gone past 50,000. And 50,000 came from about 50,000 publications, because obviously some... Some articles don't have any figures. So um, a rough estimate from this subset is, good, is half a million figures in the database that are more discoverable. And the also good thing about this for incentivizing researchers is you can, uh, if, if somebody logs in, you can say to them, if you've published in an open access journal, the chances are you already have a, it's already there for you. You already have a profile page with all of your open access published figures. So... Um, Scientists, as a scientist myself, scientists are lazy. Scientists like things to be done for them. So if you can organize it all for them, then that's a lot easier. And a couple of extra ways we're trying to incentivize is completely open to feedback. If anyone's got any ideas or comments or saying that's a bad thing, that's a good thing, maybe you should do this. Um, so we've had a few different research groups uh, say, it'd be really great. So this came from two people at the same time. One guy submitted used Figshare, and he had all these big phylogeny trees of evolution, which he couldn't put into his paper. So he just put them all on Figshare and referred to every one. And the reviewers said, well, you've got all these amazing data sets. They're on Figshare. It'd be better if I just had to click one link and it had all of your files together. So you can group files. And at the same time, paleontologists at Imperial said, it'd be great to, we're doing these... Um, 3D images, but you can't just have a 3D image file. You've got to have all the settings for it in mini subfiles. So, just from people telling us what we want, what they wanted, we can just easily tweak it to give you a multiple file upload page or what have you. And um, one of the things I'm trying to do, this is all uh, photoshopped, but you may have noticed underneath the images there was a place, a nice b big space. And so, as I say, researchers like bigging themselves up. And so what we're doing is adding lots of alt metrics. And what you can do is you can rank the alt metrics. And um, researchers might use this just to say, you know, I had the most tweeted fi figure on Figshare in September. So the more alt metrics you have, the more you can split it up so researchers can use it to boast about their work. And so, you know, we've just got 
social networking things there, comments and discussion, uh, page views, graphical representations, because even if it's just page views and even if it's just the researcher clicking on their own page every day to check the page views, if you have it in a nice cumulative graph, it's always going up. So that's encouraging. And then the embed code is so uh, people can upload all of their research onto Figshare and then they have it somewhere. But if they want to write a document, if they want to write their thesis or in HTML format or do blog posts or whatever, you can just, like a YouTube video, pull it out, put it in your thing, and it, it'll pull in some metadata. And so that is, um, I can give you a quick demo if anyone's got any questions, but that is the long and short of the features as it is. And everywhere, uh, everyone I've talked to in science has got an opinion on it, whether it's good, whether it's bad. People say you're not allowed to do this and what have you. And it's usually just because they don't know because they're not educated about it. And so I think it's really good that all of the other repositories are doing these open access um, booklets and learning guides and what have you and trying to get that outreach done that people like myself just hacking together things like this won't be able to do. So, yeah, please, as I say, retweet my tweets. And if you want me, I'm Mark at Figshare or like us on Facebook or what have you. And if you want a demo, I can give you it or... Any questions would be great. Okay, I know that did inspire a lot of you because the the the, tw the tweet -a sphere is going a mile a minute. So uh, we have a, we have a few minutes for questions. And oh, thanks, Martin. Didn't think who's doing the mics, but uh, looks like we have a question from Les. Hi, really interesting. Thanks very much. Um, it's just amazing what you can accomplish uh, as a uh, as kind of a diversion from the, from one's actual PhD research. Sometimes, isn't it? If you're writing um, up, it's any excuse. <laughs> um, I just wondered, uh, sort of having a look around Figshare. Um, so you've got all of these um, uh, figures that you, you you've kind of managed to automate fr uh, from external sources. Um, the actual data sets, which is where the real value, I guess, will occur, you, you seem to have about, you know, sort of a handful of dozens of those mm -hmm. rather than anything else. Do you have any, um, do you have any uh, indication or good idea about how to, how to get those? Because, uh, you know, they aren't lying around in pools anywhere. Yeah, I mean, other than actively encouraging people, and this is the whole culture thing, you can tell people to upload their data sets and their raw data, they won't necessarily do this. And, and one of the ideas that we have, I have with this in one of my publications I'm going to do, it was really good to see the QR codes in the last talk. But if you, QR codes are those little squares that you can scan. And my idea is that when we're doing journal clubs and things like this, you'll see a figure and you'll say, that's a bit dodgy. You know, that, why have they represented this like this? And it'd be really good if you could just scan it and access the raw data and see why they've done that. And I want to do that, but scientists like to big up themselves, so they won't, if it, they've represented the figure like that for a reason, so it's usually dodgy. Something's going on, it's not quite clear. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> and, um, and so you can ask people to upload their data sets. It's a cultural thing, whether they will, whether they won't. Um, certain journals are suggesting that you need to do it now. There was a thing in the UK th courts the other day saying that all researchers should be uploading all of their data or at least be making efforts to make all of their data available. There's projects like Dryad. One thing we could do that I haven't done yet is there's lots of data sets available and usually data sets are available under CC0. So I could pull in all of these data sets like we're pulling in the open access figures and just it's always good to have a duplication of the data somewhere and if it's linked into your clickable name, then you have all of your figures and all of your data sets. So uh, that is one way to do it, but I prefer to get people to upload theirs. Any other questions? We're a bit squeezed for time because of the five-minute setup. We've got to do it when there are dozens of any other questions. Um, okay, I was going to say I have a quick question if no one else does. Peter? Uh, 
Peter Mayras, just to say that I think this is fantastic. I mean, we, we've talked um, uh, last night and before and so on. Um, uh, have you had any interest from journals about this? Um, uh, for example, I work with Biomed Central. They're very keen to promote open data on their journals, and this is something which is almost trivial to, uh, you know, to shunt their data into this and back and point back and so on. Um, there's been a, the, so Biomed Central have got in touch and they were talking about, but it was more to do with we're generating a list of repositories where you can upload your research. So you can upload your research here, but there might be something specifically for, I don't know, um, protein banks or something. And they, so they'll say, if you've got protein data, put it in the protein bank. If you've got figures, data sets, put them on Figshare. Whereas I just say put it all on Figshare. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, I'll ask a quick question. Um, so, uh, along those lines, if, if journals are sort of becoming, publishers are becoming dependent on the, the figures being there, um, you're, you're in the middle of getting PhD. What, what do you see as the sustainability um, uh, model for Figshare? Sustainability in terms of? of being there forever. <laughs> uh, well, luckily, in the first week of Pre-beta release, um, I spoke to somebody and there's a, there's a not-for-profit called Systems Institute and they suggested that they really liked the idea and without approaching them, they said they'd fund the hosting indefinitely. And then researchers said to me, well, what's indefinitely? Is it tomorrow? So they said for three years in the first instance and I fortunately just got some uh, funding now which can pretty much guarantee the persistence for the next 20 years. Great. So. Okay, so um, we, I guess we better let the Petrikuchas get started on time, but um, join me in thanking Mark again for inv accepting our invitation to speak.